Bruchim Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our house and to, uh, again, the new normal. We have, uh, over the last couple of weeks, been involved with, I think, a very important topic uh, of peer pressure that we all are affected by. So this is the third lecture, and not the end of it, of course, something we all have to work on, but hopefully we'll be a little bit better after we've listened. Now, everything in Ju about Judaism revolves about, around people. At Mount Sinai, at Har Sinai, we took an oath of what we call a rabus. A rabus is the concept of mutual responsibility, culpability. We are not only one nation, we are one family, actually one body. You know, when Bernie Madoff was found to be the biggest thief in history, as Jews, we all felt a little embarrassed. But why? We didn't take a dime. Yeah, but. And what happens if some Jewish scientist in Denmark receives a Nobel Peace Prize for some scientific breakthrough that you've never even heard about? And even if you didn't hear, you really, if you really did hear, you still really wouldn't understand what it was about. But still, you would be proud that a Jew, a part of your family, part of you, was being honored for a breakthrough in science that would benefit all of mankind. Now, this concept of positive peer pressure can be best viewed in the religious study halls. The preferred method of Torah study is what with, with a, we call a chavrusa. A chavr means a friend, a study partner. It is not that one cannot study by themselves, but when you study with a partner, together you both grow, and through that, the give and take, of, again, the interaction between you. Just the fact that you articulate your thoughts makes a world of difference. You know, all conversations are really made up of four individuals, you and yourself, and the other person and their self. Hearing yourself articulate a thought will many times tell you if you really understand the topic or not. We have a belief that even when we pass on to the next world, this concept of charusa, of study partner, also exists. It's a story told about a great rabbi who wanted to know who his study partner would be in the world to come. And so he fasted the halom, uh, of tzom, the, 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 the fast for at night, to have a revelation from heaven. And the question he asked is who his partner would be in the world to come. And he re received an answer. They told him that Moshe the butcher would be his study partner. The rabbi woke up with this information. And he felt that, I guess, the help in heaven is kind of like here on earth. They must have got something screwed up. How could the butcher be a study partner? So he did another fast, received another communication. But this one was a little different. Well, first it told him, yes, that Moshe would be his study partner, but it warned him not to mess with it, that he might lose his own by, by questioning this. And so he accepted it, and he felt that if Moshe, the butcher, was going to be a study partner in the world to come, let's go find out who Moshe is. And so he went to Moshe's butcher store, and he stayed outside, and through the window he watched Moshe. He figured that if Moshe was a study partner, he probably wasn't a simple butcher. He's probably one of maybe the 36 hidden tzaddikim, righteous individuals, that are the foundation, the pillar of the world. <clears throat> so he watched Moshe. What he saw, he was a butcher, a businessman. He waited on customers. He cut meat. He weighed out meat. He was a businessman. He saw nothing exceptional or unusual. Customers left and the store was empty. And then the rabbi walked in and introduced himself to Moshe. Moshe was very impressed meeting the rabbi. And he said to Moshe, Moshe, <clears throat> what's special about you? <laughs> Moshe looked at the rabbi and said, I'm nothing special about the rabbi. I'm, I'm a butcher. I'm a Jew. I do what every Jew does. I daven three times a day. I give charity. I eat kosher. <clears throat> nothing special. The rabbi looked at him and said, no, no, Moshe, there, there, there's something special about you. Think. Maybe there was something in your past that was exceptional that you've done. So Moshe thinks, and he says, you know, Rabbi, maybe one thing. He said, many years ago, as I was working in my butcher store, I looked out the front window, and there I saw a caravan that had stopped. And as they were 
preparing to move again, I noticed that in the back of the caravan there was a young lady who looked Jewish. So I walked out, I had some time, and I began talking to her, and I found that her town had been overrun by marauders, and she was taken as a captive, and now she was being taken to the slave market to be sold. And you can imagine how distraught she was losing her family and then looking forward to a life of slavery. So I went to the head of the caravan and I spoke to him. And he realized what was going on. He knew I was a Jew. So he made me pay, as they say, gesund, pretty heavy for this girl's freedom. But I did. And once I did that, I brought her into my family and we brought her up in my house. When she became marriageable age, I told my son Chaim, you know, let me give you some good advice. And I said to him that, where is he going to find a girl that's better than this girl? She was a fine individual. And then my suggestion was that he marry her and that I would take care of her dowry as if I was her father with all that was needed. My son Chaim, being a good boy, agreed. And we set the date for the Chatuna, for the wedding, and everyone was invited. Everybody that lived in the city, everybody was visiting, poor people, it made no difference, everyone. And the tables were set with food and with mashke, with booze. And I looked out before the ceremony at all the tables, everybody was laughing and having a good time. But then I noticed in the back, there was a table and it seemed like people were crying, crying. Couldn't figure out what that was about. So I went back there and I said, uh, not in the food, not in the booze. And they said, no, no, this young man, listen to his story. How can you not cry? So I put my arm around the young man's shoulder and I walked him outside and I thought, you know, that maybe uh, he needed some money, and whatever it was, I was going to help him out. So he told me a story of woe, and he said that he had been in a village, and the village was overrun by marauders, and he'd been taken as a slave, and that uh, he'd been sold into slavery, and that his beshert, the woman who he was supposed to marry, who had been destined from birth, that the two families had written up a contract, that he and this girl would marry when they got older. So, he had spent the last few years looking for her. And now he finally found her. Where is she? She's the bride to be married today. His Beshert is going to be marrying someone else. Shouldn't he be upset? So the butcher said to the rabbi, I asked him, do you have any proof of this? And he took out a piece of paper and a document, and it showed that was the case. And then I asked him, do you have any physical signs that she's the girl? And he said that on her hand there was a birthmark the sign that had the shape of a star and of course he said I knew that because I had been around you for so many years and I told him to wait and I went and talked to my son Chaim and I told him the whole story and I said to my son Chaim as I gave you advice before I'll give you good advice again my advice is step aside let these two orphans get married and I'll find you someone else for you to get married my son Chaim again being a good boy realized that this was the correct thing to do. And that day, these two orphans got married in place of my own son. And I gave them everything, everything that I would have given to my son as gifts and sent them on their way. And when the great rabbi heard this story, he put his arms around Moshe and hugged him and said, it'll be a pleasure to spend eternity with someone with a heart like yours. You know, positive peer pressure is felt not just from great rabbis, but even from simple people, even from a butcher. It's interesting that the first word of the Ten Commandments is the word anochi, meaning I, and the last word of the Ten Commandments is reacho, your friend. We believe that at the beginning of your journey in life, it's all about you. <laughs> Look at young children. Mine, mine, mine. All, everything they touch, they want it exclusively. But then hopefully through years and connecting to our spiritual values, we are able to reach the level of re'echa, your friend, where we'll all be able to connect with someone else and connect to their thoughts, not just our own, to be a true giver and not a taker. You know, there are two more examples where the Torah shows us the importance and power that peer pressure exerts. First example can be found in the fourth book of the Torah in Numbers, in the portion of Masse, chapter 35, verses 9 through 28, it deals with the laws governing someone who kills another person by accident. He's instructed to flee to what we call an Ori Miklot, a city of refuge. The Torah gives permission to the relatives of the deceased 
to take revenge on the person and kill him if they can reach the murderer before he enters the city. Once he enters the city, though, and is given asylum, then he is taken out to be judged. If he is found guilty of some negligence in the matter, the judges may sentence him to a life of exile in the city of refuge. Now, his sentence would last until the death of the Kohen Gadol to the high priest. If he were to leave the city limits before the death of the high priest, the relatives of the deceased individual could kill him and would not be charged with the crime. So, interesting information, but what does this have to do with peer pressure? And the answer is really quite a bit. There are really two questions that we have to ask. Number one is, why would he be exiled to a city of refuge? And secondly, what connection is there between this accidental murderer and the holiest man in the world, the high priest? So in order to answer the first question, we, re we need to know what were the cities of refuge? So there are six basics, there were six basic cities of refuge, three designated by Moshe on the east side of the Jordan, and three designated by Yoshua, Joshua, and Israel proper. These six cities were part of the 48 cities that were given to the priests and the Levites when the children of Israel entered the land for them to reside in. In reality, any one of the 48 cities of the Levites could be used for asylum, but these six had special laws and designation. But why would this person need to be exiled to a city of priests and Levites? Answer, peer pressure. We know that nothing is an accident. So the fact that he was exiled to a place where the majority of its residents were either priests or Levites and their families could not have been an accident. Somehow, and in some way, this person was found to have a spiritual deficiency in his soul. His cure would consist of spending time in a holier environment. It would be like going to a spa in a drier desert climate if you suffer from certain physical ailments. There is no way that a living person, person, pardon me, living in such a spiritual charged environment would not be affected in some positive way by peer pressure. Much like the example I've mentioned before about going into a perfume shop and buying nothing, but you still come out smelling better. But what can be the connection between the accidental murderer and the holiest man in the world? We believe that a spiritual leader must take responsibility for the lives of the people of his generation. If they fall off the path somehow, he is held accountable. He has a duty to set them back on the proper path. So the fact that this person was able to become involved in the act of murdering another human being somehow has his connection with some deficiency in the high priest. Their souls are intertwined in life and also in death in ways that are far beyond our understanding. So when the high priest dies, that signifies that the soul of the actual, that accidental murderer has been rehabilitated and is now ready and free to enter the secular world once again. This transformation could only happen through positive peer pressure. In the fifth book of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy and Devarim, in the portion of Ray, chapter 13, verses 13 through 19, it teaches us about what's called an ir hanidachat, a rebellious city, one that the majority of its inhabitants have turned to idol worship. That means if 51% of the populace fall under this category, then the perpetrators are put to death and all the material possessions of all of its inhabitants are burnt in the middle of the city. This even includes the possessions of those who did not serve an idol and therefore were not put to death. But why? And why this designation, rebellious city? Why would it have to be decided by percentages? Why not just judge each individual on his or her own merits? The person is not serving an idol, pardon, the person who is not serving an idol, but yet he still lives among these sinners is doing so for a reason. The reason, according to the Torah, seems to be money. What brought him to this place? Money. And why did he stay in this place? Money. Much like Lot, Avram's nephew, with Sodom. 
Why else would he live in such a lowly place? It would not. It would not. It would. It would, it would only be logical to assume that he'd be doing business with idol worshippers, and he would therefore be forced, negative peer pressure, to adjust his spiritual standards to enamor himself to them. He would have to have, a, so to speak, a blind eye and look away from their open disrespect and disregard of God and his Torah, as it states in the U.S. currency, in God we trust, which alludes to the God of the dollar. But why does the Rambam state that if 51% of the population are serving idols, then not only are the idol worshippers put to death, but all the material possessions of all the inhabitants of the city, even those that didn't serve the idol, are all destroyed. So if 49% of the populace are serving idols, they are judged as individuals. Why should two more percent, 51%, make such a difference? Since 51% of the residents have become idol worshippers, it shows that negative peer pressure has taken over. And it's just a matter of time before that virus will infect all the residents. So, destroy the virus before it infects more people. There is one more form of peer pressure that would seem to be proper, even suggested. Yet the Torah shows us that it is not acceptable to God. In the secular world, there is a statement that says imitation is the greatest form of flattery. This is not the case with religion. We read in the book of Genesis in the portion of Chayasara that after he, her death, Avram Avinu sends Eliezer, his trusted servant, who was the head of his household, to his native home to bring back a wife from his family for his son Yitzchak. Now, Eliezer had a righteous daughter, and he wanted her to marry Yitzchak. However, Avram found a flaw in him. What flaw could Avram have found in Eliezer? And the Major says that he was a carbon copy of his master in every way. To the point that when he first met with Rivka's family, they initially thought that he was actually Avram. But still, what was the fault? <laughs> The fault was that he had become Avram and had lost his own individuality. Think of a jigsaw puzzle. What if you have two pieces that are identical? What do you do? You throw the extra piece away. It's useless. Eliezer did not allow himself to grow, to develop his own relationship with his creator. We see this point illustrated again in the first blessing of the Amida, the standing prayer that we say three times a day. It says, Eloke Avram, Eloke Yitzhak, Eloke Yaakov, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So the question becomes, why repeat the word Eloke, God, of, before each of the names? Why not just say, Eloke Avram, Eloke Yitzhak, Eloke Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And guess what? We will be saying the exact same thing. The wording is very important. It teaches us that each of the forefathers served God in his own unique fashion. They were not carbon copies of each other. They were individuals. Abraham served God out of kindness. Isaac served God out of the attribute of severity. Jacob served God through the attribute of beauty, a mixture of kindness and severity. Now, each of us is unique. Each of us has their own special mission in life that only we can perform. No one else can do it for us. You know, we are called the chosen people. <laughs> Many people, Jew and Gentile alike, have had issues with this statement. Chosen. What does it really mean? I think that the answer is that we were chosen to be a light unto the nations. Our light, mission in life is to be an example of charity, morality, and godliness to the world at large. Positive peer pressure. However, Many times it is we who are influenced by their negative peer pressure to abandon those values that God has chosen for us to exemplify. We need to do a better job. Now, I'd like to end the topic with the message about what is perhaps the greatest challenge that peer pressure presents. The Talmud tells us that we, are, that we as Jews are required, commanded to give up our lives for three cardinal sins, idol worship, 
murder, and sexual infidelity. But then the sages tell us there is one sin that is worse than all these three sins, and that is the sin that we call Lashon Hara, gossiping. It is an act that occurs privately between two people. You may not be the one speaking, but our rabbis tell us that he who listens is even worse than he was speaking and that he creates an audience for the gossiper. I know, especially today with the advent of cell phone, almost everyone gossips in one form or another. But that does not change the fact that it is wrong and causes many difficulties among people associating with a better group of peers may not eliminate gossiping, but it may well limit the amount that you're exposed to. And additionally, a more refined peer may well stop gossiping if you bring it to their attention. God sees the sin of gossiping as a virus that destroys society. It brings division between ourselves and our peers, between a husband and a wife, between family, business partners, friends. He brings misery through his gossiping. What is his punishment? Leprosy. A skin disease that covers his body. You know, now there's a physical disease that is called leprosy. But no, this disease is a physical manifestation of a spiritual blemish that resides within that person. He does not go to a leper colony. There's no medication that is prescribed. In fact, there's no creams or ointments for him to apply. The cure? Solitary confinement. God wants him to experience what it feels like to be separated from those who, care, who you care for. God does not want this gossiper to be able to wreak more havoc and misery on other unsuspecting people's lives. You know, an interesting aside about this law is that if the leper is covered with leprosy, from head to toe, he is considered pure and does not have to go into solitary confinement. <laughs> but why? When the leprosy covers only part of his body, then people may not be aware of his true nature. However, if the leprosy covers his whole body, then it is evident to all that see him that God is warning them that they should keep their distance from him. You know, this pandemic has made us all realize just how precious our relationships really are. I think that it has given us all time to reflect on their importance in our lives. Good friends and family are there for good times and for the bad, or better yet, challenging times. I refuse to see anything as bad. There are things that are bitter, but bitter more often than not makes us better. Those individuals that are, are in negative peer pressure, they're only there for the party when things get real they're nowhere in sight. May God bless us all and our children that we surround ourselves with people that will influence, influence us in a positive and godly fashion. The proper peer pressure so that we can help to herald in the coming of Mashiach Sakenu quickly and in our time. I want to thank you very much for listening. By the way, what I'd like to also mention that if anyone has any suggestions on topics uh, that we could discuss in this lecture on my thoughts, uh, if you could uh, text me again at the uh, base Mordechai, um, to the TOTA, which is here again, and also TOADA36 at yahoo.com, and also at, the way around, Ah, uh, there you go. Cut the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's okay. <laughs>